This is the American Law Journal. The most common workers' comp claim, back injury, the most common prescription, opioid drugs, are painkillers and an outdated system killing workers' comp. Good evening. I'm Christopher Naughton. This is the American Law Journal. Opioid drug use and its costs are skyrocketing. How do you spell relief for a workers' comp system that may very well be leaving its injured workers behind? ALM's Gina Passarella has this. I never meant to cause you been inside the world. I never meant to cause you any pain. Pain. When Americans experience it, more and more they're being prescribed opioid drugs, such as fentanyl. But now, many are becoming addicted, or worse, like Prince, dying. On this opioids issue, this is an area where uh, the incidence of people dying from overdoses is actually spiking. And nowhere has that pain been felt more acutely than by those hurt on the job. But they get into these situations where they're injured and they go to a doctor and they get on these prescription drugs and I can't tell you how high the percentage is of when we're trying to settle a case, we can't cut off their medical because they are scared out of their mind to not have these pills anymore. The biggest trend I'm seeing is the wreckage of lives with overprescription of opiates. When you see someone going in for a back strain and they're getting a 30-day supply of Percocet, I think that's just wrong. That's why there is a movement in many states, including Pennsylvania, to change the laws, to require all medical care for injured workers be consistent with nationally recognized evidence-based medical treatment guidelines. The hope is it will cut opioid casualties and lower corporate and insurance company costs. It's that last part that makes claimants' attorneys skeptical. So House Bill 1800 is a bad thing. It's bad for doctors and it's bad for injured workers because the standard is not what a cookie-cutter model holds for your healing based on your injury. That's a decision between you and your doctor and his or her expertise and experience. Another growing concern, studies that portray state workers' comp systems as out of touch, failing injured workers, where businesses keep cutting comp benefits to pad their bottom line. The Department of Labor did a report recently, and what they found was that in a lot of states they've enacted laws that have sort of shifted the cost away from the employer when an employee gets injured and now um, that cost is being borne more by the workers themselves and the taxpayers. Recent NPR and ProPublica investigations cite Tyson Food Company of using financial influence and political muscle to cut its comp costs. After Iowa's Workers' Comp Commissioner Chris Godfrey issued decisions against Tyson, Iowa's new governor, Terry Branstad, supported by Tyson in the election, demanded Godfrey's resignation. Since he could not fire the commissioner, he slashed his salary by 30%. A lot of these big employers are very powerful lobbyists, so they've been able to sort of lobby their local governments, their state governments, to shift these costs. That's why some, including the Department of Labor, are calling for federal oversight to ensure states protect injured workers. But it's a tough question. I defend companies whose workers are injured. My clients who are in more than one state would love to see a federal standard because think of the expense to them to train and have quality control for 50 different workers' compensation laws. Uh, but do you force every other state to be under federal jurisdiction, or do you leave it to the unions and the workers and the businesses in those individual states to work out another grand bargain unique to that state's issues? The Department of Labor's conclusion is clear. The workers' comp system is outdated, and states are falling behind in protecting injured workers. But not everyone sees a federal solution as a positive. And in all likelihood, the new Trump administration would agree. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, four guests with me tonight. A fifth will join us in just a minute or two. Lori Carroll returns to the program with Nolte, Scar, Kamaza, and McDevitt. Her clients include hospitals and insurance carriers, self-insureds, and third-party administrators. George Beatty has spent over 30 years defending the rights of the injured, especially those hurt at work. 
plaintiff's attorney with Beatty Sloan and DeGeneva. The Honorable Joseph Haken joins us once again. He has been sharing his comp insights with us for almost 15 years. And Matt Wynn also returns to our program. He has more than 25 years of experience representing employers, insurance companies, and third-party administration in comp matters. I hear this from almost every workers' compensation attorney I talk to. And it doesn't matter if it's a respondent's attorney, a defense attorney, or a claimant's attorney. And that opioid drug use and drug addiction is rampant in the comp system. Well, I think it is. Um, it's so rampant in the comp system and out of the comp system. And as far as my clients are concerned, it costs a lot of money. They are spending two to three thousand dollars a month on uh, opioid medication, and it, and it really does need to be reined in. I think the opioid drug problem is, is something that's widespread. It's not limited to the workers' comp system. I think it's a societal problem, and I think it's reprehensible that the insurance industry and their lobbyists are trying to use this opioid issue as a way of gouging the rights of workers, because there's nothing different about an injured worker than an injured citizen. And the fact that there's an opioid problem is a problem that faces society a, a, as a whole. Yeah, but not George, just do you think that the doctors, the doctors who have been treating injured workers have over prescribed opioid drugs now over the last 10 years I don't think it's any different between workers compensation claimants that are injured and other people that are injured I don't think there should be two systems set up I don't think that injured workers should be treated as second-class citizens now that doesn't mean I don't think there's a problem with the opioid medication but I think it's a problem that we face as a society at large and I don't think we should allow this issue to be used as a wedge or as a lever to scale back the protections for injured workers. They shouldn't be treated like second-class citizens. They should have the same treatment rights, the same options that any other injured person would have. And I think it's wrong that they're trying to use this as a way of further curtailing workers' rights. Hey, Matt, would you say that back injuries are indeed probably the most common of all injuries, and maybe that's the genesis of, of some of this drug problem we're seeing in, in the comp system and elsewhere? It seems like it is. Uh, it's probably, uh, I would say, maybe 50% of my cases involve uh, back injury and back pain. Um, a lot of times the opioid, opioid medications are prescribed from the get-go by physicians, and unfortunately they can become really addictive within just a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I think it's a problem that both the claimants as people face because they're the ones who get addicted and also the insurance companies who end up paying for those medications. Unfortunately, sometimes doctors have it in their own best interest to prescribe them for whatever reasons they may have it, their own pecuniary interest in prescribing those drugs. And I know, Lori, that a lot of um, those on the insurance side of the ledger believe that a lot of these drugs are coming out of the doctor's offices themselves, the treating doctors, uh, that they're not going to, let's say, a pharmacy to get those drugs. They're actually purchasing them or getting them at doctor's offices. And I've heard, again, respondents' attorneys, defense attorneys say that's a problem. Right. I think that's very troubling uh, because um, the doctor has a medical incentive or a financial incentive in prescribing these medications. And so it makes it very difficult for the employer because they are just left to pay for these exorbitant amount of money for uh, opioid medications. Let's bring in Alex Halper, who is now the Director of Business and Industry Affairs for Pennsylvania's Chamber of Commerce. Alex, good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I understand that you and, and your group, the Chamber, is really behind a new bill that they'd like to get passed in the state, which deals with medical care guidelines. I'm sure there's going to be a diversity of opinion here. Tell us a little bit about it and why you're trying to get that bill passed. Sure. Uh, this is a... Um, uh, something that has become much uh, more standard, very common in states around the country. These are guidelines based on evidence with a full range of different treatment. When someone gets hurt on the job, everyone's goal should be that individual getting completely healthy, back to full function, and, and back to full wages, back to their job. And we've seen Johns Hopkins had a study that shows when evidence-based medical treatment guidelines in states where those are utilized, it, it results in better outcomes for patients. So we believe that uh, this makes sense for Pennsylvania if the goal is to get injured workers back to full function, back uh, to full health, and back to work, then this makes sense uh, here in, in Pennsylvania as well. Part of the criticism has been about this prospective bill is that it takes the power out of the hands of doctors, that it's one size fits all, and doctors are not going to have the kind of leeway that they've had in the past, because maybe we don't trust them. 
that is not uh, reflective at all of the reality we, we've seen in other states. Uh, there is a standard conventional uh, medicine and treatment guidelines, and this is not just for workers' comp, this is in all health care that's utilized when someone gets, gets injured. And, and there's no reason why an injured worker ought to be treated differently than anyone else who gets injured uh, that's covered by any other type of health care. We totally and, agree. And, and I appreciate that. I think and, and, and uh, uh, I hope we can work together to advance this because, again, it's about the, the best interest of the patient and we've, we have the experience of other states where this has been beneficial and there's no reason why it wouldn't be uh, helpful in Pennsylvania as well. It's really not in the best interest of the patient. And when I said that, I said I agree with you that our goal is to get people back to work and our goal is to treat them like everyone else. But what this law does, which is pushed by the Chamber of Commerce, by the insurance industry, by the lobbyists for big business, is to try to make work injured workers second-class citizens and they're not treated like everybody else everybody else could go to a doctor and get that doctor's best advice best treatment tailored specifically for that person's injury that person's condition but what they want to do in this law is to make every injured worker treated as a second-class citizen they're only allowed to get this treatment or that treatment decided by a panel of politically appointed doctors. So the politicians will appoint a panel of doctors that they control and that panel of doctors will say the only treatment that's allowed for this kind of injury is A, B, or C. Taking away the doctor's discretion, taking away the rights of an injured George, worker, George, making the injured worker less than anybody else who's injured. I, I, I think would it's just wrong. And I of would course you don't agree because well, if this is all about making it cheaper so insurance companies can make more money. I would it's encourage you to read a, a recent report out of the Johns Hopkins University that showed better outcomes for patients when treatment guidelines are utilized. So and, and again, doctors. this is not uh, this is not prescriptive medicine. Uh, any any healthcare professional will tell you that for a particular injury, there are treatments and uh, a, a range of treatments that are considered evidence-based, and experience has shown that they are effective. And under this type of framework. If a physician believes that a patient is unique and needs treatment that falls outside of what conventional medicine would say is appropriate, then there's a process of obtaining a waiver. But yeah, I think we, we both agree in the sense that an injured worker uh, is, is similar, if not the same, to just an, a citizen who gets injured and is covered by, by regular group health. Alex, we're talking, me, about, yeah, the same, we're talking Alex, about the same health care. Alex, give me an example of what you mean by standardized guidelines, because you know those are just words right now. I mean, give me an illustration of what an injured worker sure. will be faced with now if this bill passes. You mentioned uh, back injuries or strained backs are very uh, common with workers' comp, and that's very true. Uh, you may have, and this is just an example, uh, you may have treatment guidelines that say uh, this type of a back strain with this level of, uh, of severity, of this seriousness, with this body type, we would expect there to be between 5 and 25 physical therapy visits during the course of the treatment. So that is automatically covered. The benefit to the healthcare provider is they don't have to question whether it's going to be uh, approved or whether it's gonna, there's going to be an objection to it. That's already covered. And if they believe that for some reason their patient is unique and requires treatment beyond the high end of the range that evidence and experience shows is necessary, how difficult, then they can apply Alex, for a waiver. How difficult is that threshold going to be to show that they can kind of get outside the system? That's, that's the beauty of this system is that all the rules are laid out. The problem right now is we have a system that says uh, they, we have a law that says if it's reasonable and necessary, then it gets covered. And then lawyers just end up fighting it out what reasonable and necessary means. And that's why Pennsylvania is one of the most litigious states in the country when it comes to workers' comp. We just need some rules of the game. We don't, it shouldn't benefit one side or the other. The evidence and physicians and doctors should be, should be saying, should be demonstrating what the rules are. Well, you should also know that pro... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Christopher. I, I can't, don't, Go ahead, Jerry. I, I just can't disagree more. Since 2012, that, the lost cost filings, that's, those are the things that insurance companies put up there and showing if they're making money or losing money or which way the premium should go. Since 2012, every year those numbers have gone down. The insurance companies are doing better, the costs are going lower each year for the last four years. And that, that system's not and broken. Emplo employers and, have been investing a lot in workplace safety and it is a blessing that we're having so many fewer workplace accidents that are bringing those costs low. But if you're that one employer, if you're that small business that has one 
uh, that has a, a case where the costs just start to skyrocket and, and the wrong people get involved, then that employer is not seeing their premiums go down. They're probably seeing a huge premium spike. Alex, I think you just highlighted the issue right there. You said that, empo that employer, that if that employer sees this, no, it's insurance companies. The employers have to be insured under state law. What about that injured worker? That injured worker is now going to be treated differently than his neighbor who, who got an injury not at work. The, in the, the neighbor who got an injury not at work can get therapy. He may need acupuncture. He may need chiropractic. He may need something different. I've been doing this for 34 years, and I've seen all kinds of variation in the needs of my clients and the patients. And for you to suggest that it's a good thing to make workers be second-class citizens and have to get only certain specified treatment mm. determined by a panel of politically appointed doctors who are put there by the insurance industry to save the insurance industry money is just reprehensible. Let me get Lori Carroll in here. We'll get back to you, gentlemen. Go ahead, Lori. Well, of course, I'm going to agree with uh, Alex. Reasonable and necessary treatment, that's not a legal issue. That's a medical issue. We turned it into a legal issue. At once, when the law changed, I thought that it would be a medical issue, that you had an impartial doctor looking at a person's treatment, deciding what was reasonable and necessary. Yes. And it was working for a minute, and then that decision is appealed. Then it goes to judges, someone like Judge Haken, who has to determine what's reasonable and what's necessary. How does he go about doing that? How does he do it? Because now I'm litigating, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but now I'm litigating what's reasonable and necessary when an impartial physician just told me what was reasonable and necessary. And why do you need to litigate that? An I agree. An impartial physician, and that's the, the problem, Lori. They're not impartial. They're appointed. They're politically appointed. These doctors are going to be appointed <laughs> on a panel, and they're going to serve a six-year term according to this proposed legislation. And who knows who gets on this panel? I want to be able to tell my client, you go no. to your doctor, and if the treatment is reasonable okay. and necessary, then it gets covered. And we have people like Judge Haken who will be able to say, is this reasonable or necessary? You're entitled to your due process. You're entitled to your that's, treatment. That's and not it's not a, taken away into a cookie cutter, every one size fits all. It's just not fair it, to save money. And the system's not even broken. They're spending less money over the last four years. I know it's happened in other states, but I think you need to follow the money. If I think most doctors, I'm, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I think most doctors worth their weight are impartial. They are, there are set standards of treatment, and those doctors yeah. want to make sure that those set standards are covered. You have doctors, not the ones who profit off of a person's misery and keep you know, prescribing drugs and keep, and they, that doctor keeps prescribing physical therapy. Not that doctor that profits off of someone's misery, but a doctor who is really concentrated on restoring that person back to their pre-injury position. Those doctors can be on the well, panel, right now, and those yeah, doctors I, I would know a, what reasonable and necessary treatment is and what those standards are. I would like to ask I Judge think. Haken, Judge, if, if Judge Haken sees a doctor who is, as you say, Lori, profiting from someone's misery, Judge Haken is going to say no. I'm not, that is not reasonable treatment. It's not necessary and treatment. And I was trying to keep Judge Haken out of the politics as much as possible, and yeah. I think there's some daylight here. So go ahead, Judge. And, and, and I want to stay out of the controversy that really surrounds this area. All I can talk to, frankly, is the, the system as we have it. Uh, the judge's responsibility is to be impartial, to hear the evidence, and come to a just decision to the best they can or she can. Now, the current system, whether on any drug, if a, if a claimant is, is taking some sort of prescription medication or any other kind of treatment, if in fact it's deemed expected that it's not reasonable or necessary, that is the standard, the party can go to utilization review in which the opinion of the utilization review doctor or provider, whoever it might be, mm -hmm. uh, comes into evidence as a matter of law and, and the parties are free to present any other kind of evidence they want to present and the judge then determines as a whole whether or not the treatment is reasonable and necessary. But Judge, it sounds like, and again, no. forgive me, Alex, if I use this term, but it sounds like standardized guidelines of sorts. There are a couple of exceptions, but you're trying to standardize the system. So in some ways, what comes to, your, what comes to the bench now is going to be a little bit different. 
Yeah, yeah I, I, I would expect likely. it would be. Whether, whether or not it's better or not, though, is not for me to determine. I yeah. have no opinion in regard to that. I, I, think, I think it's important to realize that they're not only trying to take away the doctor's ability to decide what's right for his or her patient, which is important. There's a physician-patient relationship between the injured worker and the doctor. This legislation would basically take that away from the doctor and say, you have to do this. It also takes away from the judge. What Judge Haken just described was a system that's been in place for over 20 years that works, that each person that's getting treatment, if the treatment isn't being effective, if, if, a, if a doctor's profiting under misery, then the insurance company could come in and say, you're not treating this person reasonably. It's not necessary. They could go litigate the issue. Judge Haken is there for that purpose. So they're taking away not only the doctor's discretion, they're going to tell the judges how they have to decide the case. This is unconscionable. I don't see and if you look at the background, I think it's important to realize what's behind this. You need to follow the money. So when you look at who donates to the Republican candidates for state legislature and state senate, the people who are, who are pushing this, the insurance industry and, their, and Chamber of Commerce people donate large amounts of money to the Republican campaigns. They come in, they try to pass legislation like this that would cut off injured workers' rights. We've got Just some, follow some the money. I think we've got see, some, some, see red, some red herrings. We, uh, I'm not sure, and I say with all due respect, uh, I don't see how you can say that, that uh, two lawyers and a judge arguing about what constitutes good medicine makes more sense than a system in which the evidence from uh, medical professionals and the experience all over the country and the millions of different uh, back strains that have been experienced in our country over the years and being able to show uh, what range of treatment is acceptable is, is not the more logical approach. Matt, let me, let me get you in here because I would have to say again, your defense counsel, respondent's counsel in, in workers' compensation, isn't it legitimate to say that a lot of what we are facing here is because of the drug use, the opioid drug use that is being prescribed to people in the comp system, and maybe costs have gotten out of hand. Don't you think that this is a driving force behind this legislation, and maybe that's fair? I think it's the opioid drug use. I think it's the endless physical therapy, the endless chiropractic treatment. Uh, to your viewers out there, if you're not a workers' comp claimant, you may not even know what we're talking about because most private insurance has limits on how many visits you can get to the chiropractor, how many times you can go for physical therapy, and what drugs you can get. It's only in workers' compensation where those benefits are endless unless the insurance company finally takes up the proactive uh, position and files a utilization review, which takes months to be resolved. In the meantime, claimants are getting uh, chiropractic care, physical therapy three or four times a week for months on end, much more than you would ever get in the private system. And I think what Alex is talking about is just going to kind of bring the workers' comp system in line with what really exists already in the private insurance. I mean, it's, it's not broken. It doesn't need to be fixed because what Matt just described is a situation when one claimant gets out of hand and let's say a doctor is over treating. There is a remedy. There's a utilization review process that works and the person gets due process. There's not predetermined cookie cutter, uh, one size fits all uh, methods. What happens here is the insurance company says, hey, you're over treating. They file a utilization review. If it goes to Judge Haken, he has to decide it. Yeah, is but, it reasonable or necessary? Like so it's, if the system's not broken, don't fix it. It is broken it because is broken. the UR system only examines one provider. You can just switch to a different chiropractor in the same office and treat with him. And when I file a UR against that chiropractor, you switch to another one. It's kind of a game. You keep on treating until this case settles and then magically the claim is cured and the treatment stops. I have to say goodnight to Alex Halper at this point. Uh, Alex, again, with the Pennsylvania Chamber of Commerce, and it's HB 1800, correct, uh, well, Alex? That, that's what it was in the previous session, and okay. uh, we're expecting it to get uh, reintroduced this coming uh, January. Okay, and then uh, prospectively, again, these things can sit around for a while, can they not? They, they have, but we have, uh, I think, some uh, momentum here. We have uh, a broad, uh, broad, broad coalition who are interested in bringing a little bit of structure to this workers' comp system. We're clearly dealing with a little bit of uh, misinformation out there, maybe some misunderstanding about what this legislation is actually intended to do and what the impact would be, but I'm, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic. Thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Lauren, you probably don't agree that states are falling behind in protecting injured workers, and yet 
all the statistics, and you were on a program last year. Right. We talked about ProPublica and NPR, <laughs> and they talked about some of the, and, and Pennsylvania right. is almost at the bottom. It's like 43 out of 50 states that there is a decrease in benefits for injured workers. Those are not my statistics. That's DOL, NPR, and ProPublica. I've always been a firm believer in balance. Uh, there is a cost of doing business in Pennsylvania. Employers look at those costs. The high cost of workers' comp or taxes or health care, all of those are in the basket when an employer thinks about cost of doing business. You have to keep the cost low in Pennsylvania to have uh, employers want to do business in Pennsylvania. And I think, I do not think, um, uh, like I said before, uh, in Pennsylvania, it used to be very climate oriented. I think right now, we are becoming more of a balanced system that um, helps both the employee, but helps with the employer try to control cost. So that employer will stay doing business in Pennsylvania, and um, that employer will have the insurance, the workers' comp insurance, to help other injured employees. Let's move on to some other topics that may be a little less politically charged, although maybe not. Matt, what about IMEs? What's happening in your practice regarding independent medical exams? Well, independent medical examinations occur whenever a claimant has been on workers' compensation for a period of time. They're now no longer treating with the panel physicians, the so-called company doctors, and the employer of the insurance company needs to determine what the status is. Has the claimant fully recovered? or if not, what kind of work can they do? We need to have the patient examined by an independent physician to see if the opinions of their doctors are the same as what the independent physician comes up with. IMEs can be done twice a year, generally, and uh, all my clients really uh, utilize them mostly to try to get somebody back to work. If the IME doctor says they're fully recovered, we offer them their full duty job back. If they can only do light duty, we try to find something that's within their physical capabilities. And what happens in these cases, if the claimant does not return to a job that they are found capable of doing, their benefits can be suspended. So that's what we use them for. That's an expensive part of our practice. The IMEs are expensive. If it goes to litigation, the depositions of the experts are expensive. Uh, but if it comes down to it, that's pretty much how it works in Pennsylvania. I hate to sound cynical, and, and I agree with Matt. It is an expensive part of the litigation for the insurance companies because they're really not independent medical exams. They're defense medical exams. They're not an IME, they're a DME. If an insurance company is going to pick a doctor to examine an injured worker, they're not going to go pick an honest, impartial, independent doctor. They're going to pick a doctor that's going to say what they want them to say. So if the doctor says too often, oh wow, this guy's hurt really bad, he should stay on workers comp, he's not able to work, they're going to get rid of him. They're going to hire the doctor that says what they want. And Matt's right, it is very expensive for them. They have to pay this doctor thousands of dollars to give these opinions, take his testimony, and hope that the judge buys it. Now, you know, we see all kinds of DME doctors. Some are more credible than others. And Judge Haken sees them all. He sees it all. And sometimes he'll see the same doctor again and again and again for the insurance company. And I think that there's some issues about credibility. And it is a very expensive part of the system. And that's unfortunate. Oh, I think George is right. A doctor that's used too much, who seems to give the opinion that the insurance company wants every time, will not be believed. And his opinion is useless. I'm not going to pay several hundred dollars to have somebody examined by a physician that no judge will believe. So we're always on the lookout to find different doctors to try out. We try to tailor it to the specific kind of injury. We want the specific kind of specialist who's going to issue a credible opinion. And I'm sure if Judge Haken sees the same doctor in four cases in a row, he's going to figure out that that's just a popular doctor because he gives the opinion that the insurance company wants. It's not what we want. Judge, we haven't put you in a political box tonight, have we? I hope not. <laughs> Let me repeat, I cannot make any, I cannot get involved in any controversy. And I want to thank Judge Haken for joining us tonight again, because we knew that some of this was right. going to be politically right. tinged, but right. we kept you out of the fray as much okay. as we could. Judge Haken, of course, has been on the bench for many years in Pennsylvania as a workers' compensation judge, and again, we've been very fortunate to have him here on ALJ for about 15 years. I want to thank Lori Carroll for joining us tonight, defense Always attorney, respondent's attorney with Nolte, Scaracamaza, and McDevitt. George Beatty, the opinionated George Beatty, plaintiff's attorney <laughs> with Beatty Sloan in DeGeneva, and Matt Wynn for the defense with the law offices of Matt Wynn in the greater Philadelphia area. For all of us here at ALJ, thanks for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed.
This week's American Law Journal is made possible in part by Law Catalyst, video and film production for the legal profession. Go to lawcatalyst.com. King Spry, serving its Pennsylvania clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law for over 30 years. Blank Rome, providing strategic advice for employers in today's workplace. Swartz Cullenton PC, a personal injury law firm that concentrates on safeguarding the wounded. Get the justice you deserve. And The Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media publication and the oldest law journal in the United States.